but God demonstrated his own love for us. While we were still sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Overwhelming comfort, absolute assurance, rock solid reality. That is exactly what the Lord is giving you this morning in these verses. When you read through these verses, Romans 8, 31 through 39, they are so clear. They are meant to give you unshakable security when you face the struggles, the suffering, the difficulty that you will face as a follower in Christ in a world that does not want you to follow Christ, or even competing against your own sinful nature that does not want you to stand in Christ. The scriptures, and this is some of the most beautiful scriptures there is in giving you this truth, that even though you suffer in this life, and even though from your vantage point, the way you see things, the way you feel about things, the way you're reading your situations from that vantage point, it looks like things have spun completely out of control. As if someone would ask you what's happening in life, you'd say, the train has come off the rails. It, it, it's all over the place. The Lord is saying, no, take your security in Christ. This is blood-bought security that you stand in. Romans 8 has an incredible structure to it. In fact, the theme of Romans 8, if you want to make some themes for it, you could say that the theme of Romans 8 is Christian assurance and absolute security no matter what you're facing. Because God is greater and God is outside what you're facing. God will take care of his people. God calls you to himself and he makes guarantees to you that he will not just continue the work he has begun, but he will complete it. So Romans 8 has been telling us things. It's been sharing glorious truths with us. In fact, Romans 8, 28, that remarkable verse is telling us that God, you love God, you've been called by him according to his purposes. He's going to work out everything, not just some things, not the good things, not the pleasant things, but everything in your life to his good and gracious will and purpose, which then will be for your good. And then in verse 30, you are assured that you never have to worry about your final destination or your final glorification. It is taken care of. You will be with Christ. And so the, the sermon text that we're about to look at, it starts off with stating that if God is for you, if the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who keeps the universe and the vast universe and the galaxies together is for you, who really can be against you? If this God is for you that sent his only begotten son to come into the world and live your life that you couldn't live because we're sinful and take our punishment that we truly deserve. If God has done this for us, he will make sure you have all that you need. You will lack nothing in him. In fact, Paul is saying this God also justifies you. The justifier is just and he will be with you. Nothing can stick against you in the courtroom. No accusations can be brought against you because God is on your side. In fact, Jesus, who's on your side, who lived for you, who died for you, is at the right hand of the Father right now making intercessions on your behalf. The chapter begins with Paul really, if you remember all the way back to the first part of Romans 1, saying there's no condemnation. Condemnation is the opposite of justification. If justification is declaring one righteous, then condemnation is declaring one guilty. And Paul is saying, there is no condemnation on you. He starts the chapter with that, and you notice he ends the chapter by saying there'll be no separation. There's no separation from the love that Christ has for you. Nothing can break that. The love that Christ has for you. He's ministering to people like us who have needs and who have problems, these truths. All people of all times, the Bible is clear, will encounter suffering in this world. There'll be trials, there'll be uh, circumstances and situations beyond your control and some that you just don't want to deal with. To be tempted to run and, and want to hide and make it all go away. In fact, you might be in some situations that are absolutely threatening, menacing, and incredibly dangerous to your faith right now. 
as Paul is writing to those in Rome, he's saying, your present suffering. In fact, he defines the present suffering in a gripping way. He talks about their present suffering, that they're groaning under the trials, that they are so beat down. They don't even know what they're praying for, but they know they're in pain and they are calling out to the Lord. With such insecurity abounding in their lives, those people then, like us people now, need assurance because we have insecurities. We need real assurance that we're going to be taken care of. And that's what Paul offers. He offers real assurance based in Christ, found in the Word of God. I want you to appreciate this for a moment. I want you to appreciate exactly how the Apostle Paul lays this out. Because this might seem counterproductive to us. This might seem very, very counterproductive. So Paul's writing to a group of Christians, as you know, and they're being persecuted for their faith. They're encountering all sorts of difficulties, all sorts of hardship, all sorts of trouble. So Paul's answer to help them on a practical level, to help them on a personal level, to help them in a way that they can apply this help to their life in the midst of these very, very trying situations is this. He doesn't lecture them about soldiering on and, you know, pulling themselves up from their bootstraps. You're tougher than that kind of thing. He doesn't give them, well, here's the seven steps. Okay, here's step one, do this, and then step two, and then step three, and you'll be great, you'll be fine. And he doesn't pump them up with a big rah-rah speech. What he does is so amazing. He takes their attention right to Jesus. He says, look at Jesus. Find yourself in Jesus. Look to Jesus for your strength, for your comfort, for your confidence. Jesus has won the day. His victory continues to this very moment. Only Jesus will see you through this. Well, we're people who live in tough situations, and, and, and the question on our lips, the question bouncing around in here and up here at times, we would have to agree, is simply this. Is God truly able to help me? Is the help from God adequate? Meaning, is it just theor uh, theoretical convictions, nice platitudes that we get together and talk about, and then we got to go figure it out and live our life? The Apostle Paul is ministering to that thinking, oh, Jesus is more than adequate. Through Christ, you not only conquer, you're a super conqueror. Here's the text, Romans 8, 31 through... 39. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who then will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is it, or who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, was raised to life, is at the right hand of God, and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it's written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to the slaughter? No. And all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor death, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. These are the very words of God written and preserved for us down through the centuries for our instruction, for our growth, for our assurance that we are loved by God and called according to his purpose. That the Lord then may strengthen us in this present hour and into the future, so we pray. Sanctify us by your truth, O Lord. Your word is truth. Amen. In facing great difficulties and facing great sorrow, and there's no way to downplay this, yet there's no way to probably truly express it the way we would like, so we really capture the moment. It was Job who said these words in Job 121 and also then in 4211. Job said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord.
He's answering the question. The Apostle Paul is answering the question, is God truly able to help? This chapter screams a resounding yes. Yes, he is. The Holy Spirit seeks to give us, when we spend time in these words, he seeks to give us a deep, a firm, an unshakable, blood-bought security through Christ that when we face the trials, when we face the struggles, when we face the difficult situations, we will not leave God. We will not curse God. We will not say, God, you're the worst. You failed and let me down. We won't turn our back on him, but rather you will be moved to hold fast to him all the tighter, all the stronger, all the closer, and find only that satisfaction and contentment that God can give. And then you know it will never be taken away because God is the giver and God is the keeper. There's no promise in the Bible anywhere. I mean, find it if you do. Point it out to me. I've never seen it. Of God saying you will have a comfortable earthly life. You're not going to find that. Now, when the Lord does bring comfort, when he does bring seasons of comfort here on earth, rejoice in him. Thank God for that. Look at it and say, Lord, thank you for blessing me in such a way I don't deserve it, but you're giving it to me. Oh, keep it going, Lord. But at the same time, we wouldn't want that comfort if that comfort meant our eyes are off of Jesus. We wouldn't trade earthly comfort and earthly security for eternal comfort and eternal security in Christ and eternal realities. We wouldn't want that. And so the scripture frees you. This scripture frees you not to see earthly comfort and earthly security is all that matters and where you want to live and where you want to be, but to see Jesus and the eternal realities that he brings to you. And then it gives you the ability to face all situations in life knowing that Christ is with you and that he keeps his word, that you are loved, that you are redeemed, that you are called out of this world and sanctified by God. You have a conquering God who enables you through him to be more than a conqueror. So this is massive security for service in the Lord here. And this is great. In fact, look at verse 31. Paul says, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? What are the these things? Paul has been talking about these things. All the troubles that we face living here on planet Earth, that's the these things. All the difficulties, all the struggles, all the ugly things that sin has brought, that Satan has brought into this world, that our own treacherous flesh loves to indulge itself in these terrible things. These are the these things. Paul is saying if God is for us, who can be against us? He's ministering to insecurities that we all feel. He's ministering to the insecurities that we have living in a threatening world. So these are not just blanket cliches and general words of encouragement to make you feel better in the moment and then you just go on and do whatever it is you want to do. In fact, he's not even rebuking them for being fearful and being afraid. Rather, he's speaking very personably to their hearts, their believers in Jesus, and for them to find the ultimate security in living in difficult things, the Apostle Paul takes them to some of the most deepest and richest spiritual truths ever found in the Bible. Now, we might be tempted to think, so here's Paul's answer to the struggles and difficulties in life. Go to a deep theological lecture. In a way, that's what he's doing. But look at how he does it. He does it so wonderfully. He's saying God is more than adequate to supply to all your needs in every situation. You see, there is such a temptation, and I know I fall into it. The te temptation is this. We think what we're facing is almost totally unique, as if nobody has ever faced this problem before, as if this problem is different and stands all by itself. You just don't understand what I'm dealing with. It, it's sort of like the old joke, right? You've heard it before. Somebody's having open heart surgery, you're having ankle surgery. Somebody says, well, which one is the major operation and which one is the minor? Well, of course, theirs is the minor and mine is the major because it's me. Paul is saying, trust Jesus. He's not using a cheap cliche. Rather, he's taking you right to Christ who took on your sins and the sins of this world. He drank the cup of wrath for us. It was poured out on him. Nothing held back, so we wouldn't have to. Jesus took our place on the cross. We take a place in heaven. Notice, Paul's not saying that nobody is ever against you. Remember, this is Paul. He wrote to the church in Ephesus, 
and he said, Christian life, the life of faith, it's war. It is war. You need to know that. You need to live in that. He talks about the battle that we put on for the spiritual enemies in the high places and the powers of principality that we contend with in that famous uh, Ephesians 6, 10 through 18 or 11 through 18, the armor of God section. So he gets that this is war with the eternal stakes in front of it, that all believers of all time are going to be fight, fighting this force of the devil and, and his demons, our own sinful nature in a world corrupted by sin. But the Apostle Paul is making this point that standing in Christ, you will never be thrown down. Standing in Christ, nobody can take you out. Standing in Christ, you are secure. Nothing is successful against you because nothing can beat Christ. There's so many biblical examples of, of followers of God fighting this war. We, we mentioned Job already, but probably one of the more powerful ones is Abraham. Here you have Abraham, who trusts the promise of God for 25 years, the long-awaited son, and finally the son came, and he rejoices in the promised son. But then years later, the Lord requires him to offer the son in a sacrifice. Abraham is asked the age-old question. Does Abraham love God for being God? Does he love God to get stuff? Will Abraham, will his natural and native love for his son overwhelm his love for his God? What does he do? He takes his son to Mount Moriah. He puts him on the altar. Hebrews tells us that Abraham firmly believed. Had he struck his son down, the Lord would have raised him up. For God gave the promise that through this son would come the long-awaited Savior. Yet... Abraham does not strike him down, for the Lord intervenes and saves his son and offers the sacrificial lamb in the place. Here Abraham walks, trusting the Lord. And yet we would know, we would know that on another mountain many years from there, from that point in time, on another mountain, another father would offer his son on the altar. But this father would have no substitution for his son. This father would actually have to sacrifice his son. He would deliver him up for us all. This, the heavenly father, would see his son struck, abandoned, slapped, beaten, crowned with thorns, nailed to a cross, mocked, and jeered. This father would give up his greatest treasure for us. Paul is saying, the heavenly father who gives up his greatest treasure for us, that we can live with him, do you think he would let you lack anything that you need? The Heavenly Father is going to give you the greatest, most costly, and desirable present. Do you think he's going to go cheap on the wrapping paper? Impossible, Paul says. So he moves on and says in verse 33, Who will bring a charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Notice the deep spiritual truths he's giving you. We're elected by God. We're called by God. God foreknew us before the foundations of the world were laid. He called us into being his children. Who's going to come against you? Now, somebody will come against you. Oh, there'll be, there'll be a lot of them. Primarily the accuser, the slanderer, the liar, the murderer, the great dragon, the serpent of old, the seducer. He will come against you. In fact, the Bible accurately lays that out for us in Revelation. Also, Isaiah speaks of the courtroom in which here's us, here's God the judge, here's Satan. And the accuser is going to say, God, I know you. I know you are holy. I know you are righteous. I know you are just. Damn that sinner to hell. That's what you demand. And the accuser, he's going to bring out a laundry list, and he's got a lot to work with. I know in my life, he's got plenty to work with. And he's going to lay that out in front of God the Father. Every sinful thought, every sinful action, every broken promise to God and man in front of you, Satan's going to lay it all out there for you to see. The apostle's saying, though, Satan will charge, Satan will scowl, Satan will accuse. But the charges are not going to stick. They're not going to hold up in God's court. His accusations do not have the solid footing that he wants. Why not? Why not? Because it's God who justifies. Because it's God who declares the unrighteous righteous. Because it's God who has the innocent one stand in for us and cover us with his righteousness. God punished all those sins that Satan is going to lay out on each and every one of us. And true that they will be. 
have all been poured out on Jesus Christ. Christ has taken that punishment for us. The righteous one for the unrighteous. And so then, moving from this overwhelming comfort, the Apostle Paul says this line, Who then will separate us from the love of Christ? Who will get in between the love of Christ for us? The answer, of course, is no one. The answer is nothing. Now, I want you to keep this in mind here. You need to keep this in mind. Paul is talking about Christ's love for us. Our love for Christ, we let a lot of things get in the way. In fact, we got a couple parables that show us how sinful humanity lets their love for Christ get interfered with. You think of the parable of the sower and the seed, the cares of this world, the lies of the devil, the trials and tribulations that we face choke out the love that some have for Christ. But what Paul is saying is Christ's love given to you cannot be broken by any force known. It's impossible. In fact, he wants this so solid and so fresh in our hearts, so lived out in our lives that he gives a list. He's saying trouble or tribulation, that is not going to break Christ's love for you. He's saying hardship and difficulty and distress is not going to break it. Persecution, ridicule, opposition. He's saying famine and scarcity. He's saying nakedness, the shame, the assault that we feel. He's saying the danger that threatens, the sword, the violence. These are not going to break Christ's love from you. In fact, through Christ, you've conquered all of that. You've conquered all of that, he's saying. And then he gets to his, his end point here. We'll end on this. Now, in the Greek language, this is a pretty striking thing. If we were Koine Greek readers and speakers, we would kind of step back and go, whoa, wow. This is his final point. This is his major thesis. This is his, his big punch, so to speak. Paul comes in now and he makes a powerful proclamation. He says, for I am convinced. Paul is convinced. What is he convinced of? That nothing can rip Christ away from us. And so then Paul says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.